Hello, some ghouls and some goblins. This is Something Guy 912 here with a surprise twist on what has been up to this point a analysis series on video game stories and only of the respective stories of the Borderlands series so far. But part of my inspiration for making this slight deviation is similar to that of what came to be the Borderlands 3 as a story video. Having been inundated with Wednesday near the start of this year and its respective awfulness having been eclipsed by the show that came after it managed to skirt any would-be criticisms of it, with only a few videos only going into sparse detail the problems with it. Nowadays, of course, you don't find many people defending it, as it was not only a high school drama masquerade as any semblance of furthering the characters of the Adams family, but a frankly convoluted whodunit that is forced upon the main character to drive the central plot home, to which there is little conveyance throughout in spite of its eight episode season. Despite that I want to dive into this show episode by episode unlike my contemporaries, as there seems to be a tendency for shows like this to have a season that is not only short lived in its episode span, but the episodes themselves are padded with filler or subplots that go nowhere, as though to justify the budget and or audience expectations going into it. I had the benefit of having also watched the two Adams Family movies prior to watching this show as I had some curiosity to see what they would do with a Teenage Wednesday as the main character and suffice it to say I was disappointed, confused, and angry with the result I was given. Now, unlike in my Borderlands series you could witness all the scenes and dialogue unmolested, Wednesday is a TV show heralded by Netflix that would strike the hammer on me if I play any more than a few seconds of their show without proper edits. Normally this wouldn't be a problem for my channel to get a copyright claim on this video as I don't even make money on the Borderlands vids, as a fault of me choosing to use copyrighted music, but to use the clips to that same extent would actually put my channel at risk for termination. So, with that in mind, I will do my best to relay the relevant plot beats in the show, sparingly show clips to elucidate something important happening, and intersperse the moments without the clips present with gameplay of Lies of P as a buffer. So, with all the preamble out of the way, Wednesday's show is full of woe. We open into the show with a wide shot of a high school perpetually stuck in the 1980s as a teenage Wednesday is striding about the hallways as everyone gives her a wide berth. Now you wouldn't believe me from just these few seconds alone, we are already running into problems with a fundamental misunderstanding of the dynamic of the Adams family, so let me deviate a bit into a bit of a history lesson for ya. So, The Addams Family started as a strip comic back in the 1930s that was made as a sort of subversion of what was considered at the time the normal family dynamic. The family themselves embraced their eccentricities, which were arranged from the macabre to wearing black, or even subtleties like how Morticia Adams was depicted as taller than Gomez when in most family circumstances the patriarch would be shown taller. Of course, this concept started to lose grasp as the family dynamic changed throughout the decades, but even the 90s films still held firm that belief that, while morbid and surreal in their living situation to everyone else, were a perfectly functioning family within. Here in the show, we are made to believe that not only does a idealistic 1980s high school still exist in modern times, but that someone like Wednesday Adams would not be on vogue in modern times. Which, if this show had kept the setting of its story in the 1980s, would lend some credence to why everyone depicted avoids her like the plague, but later in the episode, things like TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter are mentioned ad nauseum to remind the audience that yes, this show does take place in the current year. So, with that in mind, I'm at a loss to what I'm seeing as golf hasn't been a niche concept in some time, but that seeing someone like Wednesday would have a drove of simps worship at her feet as they proceed to demand she step on them. Speaking of the family dynamic, that also will get thrown on its head as we explore Wednesday Adams as a character, but going on. She walks up to her locker in her iconic polka dot outfit and 
get used to seeing that because you'll never see it again in the show, to find her brother, Pugsley, was stuffed inside it, presumably by the jocks who were chiding her from a distance. Of course, normal deduction like that is far too smart for Wednesday to solve as she is granted a new plot device MacGuffin while trying to unravel Pugsley, being able to see into the past of other people. And when I say plot device, I mean it, as it is used heavily throughout the show as a way to give easy breadcrumbs for Wednesday throughout her adventure, as though the writers were not confident in Wednesday's own ability to logically deduce or track on her own without it, in spite of how much they desperately try to remind you how smart she is. More on that later! Anyhow, she gets a flashback of the obvious and goes about retributing this slight against her brother in the only way she can, by trying to kill them with a pack of piranhas. Now, I will say I do appreciate that they kept one thing somewhat consistent throughout this show about Wednesday, that in spite of her standoffish nature, she is usually keen on protecting those who are socially outcast against their will, as was depicted during her summer camp venture in Adam's Family Values. But there are more problems with this scene. If the entire school board is supposedly so avid to keep their distance from her, why in the ever-loving fuck would the jocks have dared bully the sibling of said person. It just comes off as contrived as fuck on top of being extremely cliche that the jocks for no other reason other than that they can would bully some preteen to a lot the next scene. So Wednesday goes to the school natatorium where the jocks are presumably practicing water polo or something and does the aforementioned, unleash a pack of piranhas to tear them apart. Now again, multiple problems with this scene. In spite of what Hollywood would have you believe, piranhas are not as bloodthirsty or ruthless as this scene depicts. In fact, they would likely be scared of the divers considering they aren't injured nor moving in a way that would imply injury. But let's just say for the sake of this scene that they are. Most swimming pools have chlorine in them, meaning the moment that Wednesday did release those piranhas, they'd sooner die than get to their intended target. Nevertheless, the scene carries on regardless of these facts, and one manages to nibble what is one of the bullies' ball sack because testicular pain is always an easy joke in shows like this. And then in comes the opening credits to the show, which loves to remind you that it's directed by Tim Burton, as his name is typically stapled among stuff in the goth genre, but you'd be hard pressed to find his handiwork in most of the show, especially when a different director did half of the episodes in said show. That being said, the change of hands might also account for certain plot elements that aren't elaborated upon or are convoluted in delivery. Anyhow, we cut to the Adams family car where Morticia and Gomez do what they typically do when they're in breathing distance of each other while Wednesday watches in disgust. Throughout panning between the Adams perspective and Wednesdays, we get a bit of a back and forth that goes... I have no interest in following in your footsteps, becoming captain of the fencing team. Queen of the Dark Prom, President of the Seance Society. Keep this line of dialogue as it will be important later, but throughout, Wednesday shows extreme disdain for her parents for... reasons. It's not really elaborated upon and only brought up again in Episode 6 when the Adams Family becomes relevant again, but not even in the movies did I even suspect any resentment towards her parents beyond sending her to summer camp, which again had more onus on the antagonist than her parents really. So this comes off as a complete left field. And while, yes, arguments of adaptation faithfulness will always muddy the waters when talking about consistent character motivations, even taken into the show by itself, it is not consistent with Wednesday's abhorrence towards walking in their shadow. More importantly, this line will also get pinned when we discover later just how many schools Wednesday has moved to, as the sole reason this scene is playing out is to exposit to us that Wednesday got expelled from the school that we saw for her little stunt and is now going to Nevermore Academy as a last-ditch effort. Again, I will say that the black humor of this show is sometimes on point as Wednesday expresses disappointment of getting an attempted murder charge not because of the charge itself, but that she didn't finish the job per se, but that's a cold comfort to the stone cold bitterness she shares with her parents who seem utterly perplexed as to her disposition towards them. Again, the show makes another major misunderstanding of the Adams dynamic, that they were all eccentric and embraced each other's own eccentricities, but here, Wednesday is depicted as the outlier amongst a lot while her family have tried to wrangle her in the only way they know how, as though even the characters are realizing how 
out of character Wednesday feels compared to how she was prior. Once we've sidelined the central setting of the show, we pan to another car where some local drops off a hiker looking for a scenic trail around Nevermore. Of course, he's going to be a casualty of the central plot involving a string of murders that Wednesday will get involved in, and how? Well, you gotta wait and see till the end. The Adams make it to Nevermore proper, and we are introduced to none other than Captain Phasma herself. Not to rag on Gwendolyn Christie with that remark, as her actions and character in this show is far more substantial than whatever Chrome Dome was doing in Star Wars. Anyhow, there is this little gripe that I have with the editing of this show where it awkwardly has these full facial shots before I'm jamming into a wider shot of the other perspective. And it does this constantly throughout, like as though the character is talking right at me. Which is weird considering some other panning shots don't focus in on the face only, like in this exchange that Wednesday and Principal Weems have. There isn't much to prod here except for the fact that Principal Weems says that Wednesday has moved to eight schools in the last five years, meaning that what Wednesday said earlier about her parents trying to mold her into a version of themselves by a way of sending her to Nevermore is complete bullshit if this is true. So like I said, even the show can't even substantiate the narrative it's trying to tell us. And don't worry, there will be more problems the farther we go. Weems is able to fit Wednesday into the Academy midterm as a result of Wednesday's perfect grades and the Adams' tight history with the Academy itself. There will be more to come about that history later, but another thing that is a bit off is how the Academy functions as to whom can actually attend it, as the Academy is filled with outcasts who have supernatural powers and the Adams seem utterly absent of it but go regardless. After fitting Wednesday in, do we also establish that Wednesday also needs to attend court-ordered therapy sessions to which Weem says there's one in the nearby town of Jericho she could go to, which allots certain other things in the story to happen in the story around Jericho itself. Wednesday is given her dorm and thusly introduced to Anid, who is supposed to be everything Wednesday is not. Extremely bubbly, colorful, enthusiastic, and of course, absolutely smothering for attention. You could almost say she's supposed to be a heel to Wednesday, but they grow a complicated friendship throughout the episodes in spite of how much of a turnoff Wednesday is to everyone. Which brings in another problem about Wednesday's dynamic with the rest of the cast we will be injected with. She makes herself as unlikable to those around her, and yet at every turn, they either toss it aside or put up with it only up until one episode in the entire season. I know I said earlier that Wednesday would be a catch in modern day schools with her get up, but that would be the extent of it. Any time anyone would even stand five seconds of her would later realize that it's not worth the trouble. Yet in this show, people are drawn to her like flies on shit no matter how repugnant she is to them. After showing Wednesday the dorm and each shows Wednesday the door to the rest of the academy and what will be exposition central for the faculties and cliques throughout Nevermore Academy. While Anid tries to explain to Wednesday the ins and outs, Wednesday makes it perfectly clear that throughout this entire episode she will stop at nothing to find a way to leave this academy to do... something? Again, it's not very well explained why Wednesday is so adamant to leave when in the prior school she seemed willing to put up with the archaic nature of it, especially if we're made to believe that Wednesday believes her parents are attempting to mold her into a version of themselves by way of schools like that. like. Even the show tries to substantiate that point by Wednesday saying that... It's all a part of their nefarious yet completely obvious plan. What plan? To turn me into a version of themselves. Which, Wednesday, you were the one that got yourself into Nevermore Academy in the first place by getting yourself expelled at every possible school available to them. And if it's so fucking obvious, why wouldn't the parents have sent you to Nevermore first before any of the rest. But this is just the diegetic amount of tolerance that I have for Wednesday's wanting to sound smart attitude throughout this show as she really loves to have the last word in any conversation she has despite claiming to show little enthusiasm for anything regarding the events unfolding. We get introduced to the Quad, which is the central courtyard and what will be the central staging piece for the penultimate moment in the show, but more on that later. We have the Cliques show, which Anid makes sure to remind us that those who aren't supernatural are called 
normies throughout both Jericho and Nevermore, which, gotta say, why of all phrases you chose one primarily used for 4chan is beyond me. Anyhow, the four main cliques are the Fangs, Furs, Scales, and Stoners, which is short for Vampires, Werewolves, Sirens, and Gorgons. But you'd be forgiven for thinking there was only three, as the vampires literally do not have any bearing on the plots or even the functions of the Academy in spite of their presumed immortality in said universe. Even more troubling than that is just even the concept of these supernatural beings existing in a school and in a world that just takes it as just another one of those days when massive consequences and implications would happen from their existence alone. But their supernatural functions feel more set dressing than anything else, as you could exchange them for the jocks, socias, greasers, and nerds, and not much of the plot surrounding the show would change, really. Anyhow, Anid mentions to Wednesday the student crown of the Academy, Bianca Bailey, and her affair with one Xavier Thorpe by name to remind the audience that yes, these characters will be central to the plot in some way or another. Bianca becomes sort of a rival to Wednesday, and Xavier will no doubt become one of Wednesday's flings, because again, with this being a glorified high school drama, draped with an Adams family sheen, you have to have a love triangle. We're also introduced briefly to Ajax, who is in need's crush, but we'll get to that in more in episode 3, don't worry. Another noteworthy line from Wednesday is said to a need regarding her wanting to get Wednesday in touch with social media, which will be very important for many other things she said that were the writers shoving their hand up the character's ass the grandstand, but we'll get to that too. Before the Adams leave Wednesday to her own devices, Morticia and her have a little heart-to-heart -heart moment, or should I say Morticia warns her of her plans to leave while reassuring her that she'll like Nevermore for her own reasons, to which the back-to-back -back feels as though two characters talking past one another as Wednesday constantly shuts down any connection she could have with Morticia, while Morticia once again has to push it aside. As a contingency to all this, Gomez unleashes Thing to watch over Wednesday, who will eventually become her moral compass throughout all of the show. So, the writers realized that if it was just Wednesday we're seeing, that it would hardly warrant this being considered a Adam's Family show, but chose to have the only character that can't talk be present around Wednesday. Just brilliant. Panning back to the latest string of murders, we see two cops trying to pin the situation on a bear attack as to not scare the public, as well as the sheriff trying to pin this somehow and nevermore being at fault. He'll be important for a dynamic with another character, but we've not even been introduced to them yet. Back to Ophelia Hall, Wednesday proceeds to make her side her own while exchanging quips against a need before we're introduced to Miss Thornhill, the only ugh, normie faculty working at Nevermore, which should be a big clue to her eventual importance throughout the story. She brings Wednesday a flower to her personal flavor while breaking down the campus rules for going to and fro Jericho, which will get disregarded and brought back up again throughout the show's runtime. In fact, a lot of the spatial presence of things will get largely discarded to have characters show up when prescient, but that will be more to do with episode 3 and 7 specifically. The following day, we pan to a fencing room as Wednesday walks in like she fucking owns the place, witnesses Bianca being down her challenger by the name of Rowan, he will be again important but not for very long, and proceeds to challenge her after Bianca herself feels unchallenged. Now, remind me what Wednesday said about her parents molding her to a version of herself? Wednesday is quite literally doing the very thing she would abhor by what she's doing right now. It's not even like Wednesday is doing this unwittingly. She purposefully walked into everyone's own matches like a cunt while already dressed for the occasion just to arbitrate the rivalry between Bianca and her. Now, if I needed to facilitate this, this circumstance happening, I'd do it like this. Have a need, continue to show her the faculties in Nevermore, including the fencing room. Have Wednesday show no interest because of the aforementioned until she notices Bianca beat down Rowan and decides to challenge her, as was previously established that she has a protective nature for the little guy. That way, we can actually endear ourselves to Wednesday while she has unwillingly put herself down the same path her mother went through while facilitating the rivalry with Bianca and the importance of Rowan later on. 
but that would require the writers to have any inkling of competence in them to remember that they just established that Wednesday doesn't want to be the fencing champion because her mother was. Compounding the problem is that Wednesday still tries to show this interest in the whole fencing thing in spite of how much of a presence she made herself here. So it's like Wednesday is talking out of both sides of her ass while doing any of this. Anyhow, we get the choreography to flex a bit as Bianca and Wednesday duel. Wednesday tries to up the ante by making it so they have no masks and no tips, to which the coach supposedly accepts this challenge. I'd imagine that the school would be under thin fucking ice if one of their students died because of this clear lack of safety for them, but there will be more where that came from regarding the lack of anything involving Nevermore. The fighting gets more intense, and in a surprising amount of restraint by the writers makes Wednesday lose her duel. She has to go to the nurse's office to get her booby fixed while she has a brief convo with Rowan, who's here for some reason. She walks out of the infirmary and almost gets killed by a statue before Xavier flings her out at the last moment, which means we pan back to the infirmary where she has to get treated again. Talk about clunking editing, am I right? Wednesday wakes up from the near-death experience while Xavier was waiting only to once again show her absolute ungratefulness for him saving her, saying this juicy line to him in regards to why he saved her. Now, I have to remind the writers, you were the one who contrived Xavier to save Wednesday at the last moment, so any nonsense about this patriarchal chivalry falls on deaf ears. Supposedly, Xavier has some past history with Wednesday regarding a game of hide-and-seek in which she had inadvertently saved him from being cremated, so he returned the favor, so to speak. Of course, that reconciliation doesn't allot Wednesday to even remotely apologize for her attitude with him saving her, even though even if they hadn't, that past history wouldn't justify her bitchiness anyhow. Sometime later, Wednesday finally discovers Thing has been watching her and interrogates him to service her interests rather than the parents. Again, people have called this out as in another example of the writers trying to make Wednesday seem smart, but considering Wednesday has been with Thing all her life, I believe she'd get accustomed to the way he acts and the way he smells. What I don't like about the exchange she has with him is again assuming that her parents are trying to control her more so than worried about her, especially with her attitude towards them thus far. If we had anything more foundational behind justifying her disposition towards them, I could understand her estrangement towards them, but seeing as this show chose to have the Adams family separate for a large majority of the show means this is just your average teenager saying, it's not a phase, mom. Anyhow, we enter into the town of Jericho proper where Weem sends Wednesday to her off-campus therapy session. A bit curious why the principal of all people would be sending one student to town instead of a bus full of children. Hell, even the show regards this strange curiosity. Into the therapy session itself, we once again get awkward shots of the actor's full face and view panning between the counselor and Wednesday. I guess to add to the immersiveness of what the other perspective is seeing. Again, the dialogue is Wednesday trying hard to sound smart while the counselor is blank-facedly washing all this towards her, with the only respite being the dry humor of how well Wednesday takes constructive criticism regarding her work. The only thing to comb is that the counselor is aware of her authorial work and that there is a parallel between what she writes and what she's currently going through with her mother, but we don't get time to delve into that before Wednesday finds a means to escape the session. In cues the cafe where we meet Tyler as Wednesday wants a coffee before wanting a ride out. Conveniently, the espresso machine Tyler was using has broke down, so in comes Wednesday to flex her knowledge on him and in turn the audience once more. Usually when a character is this conceited about proving to the world how smart they are, they typically are incredibly insecure about themselves. Not like the writers would know what that means. Of course, this exchange is supposed to involve Tyler as Wednesday's second fling, in spite of how much of a tryhard Wednesday has been to him thus far. Tyler offers her to drive her to the train station himself after he's off while Wednesday tries to bribe him to leave early, which in a surprising twist says he can't be bought off. Of course, that line will be made more meaningless when we discover more about who Tyler is, but still, a nice touch of character that does throw Wednesday into buying while she has to wait. As she waits, and as the counselor is well onto her plan, some normies, ugh, dressed in pilgrim gear, come in and demand Wednesday step off from their booth. 
none of these characters, save for the black one, will be relevant to the plot as they're your stereotypical bully who doesn't trust others unlike them. In cues, a fight sequence where a female a whole foot shorter than any of the bullies fends off all of them with ease. I'm starting to have to refer to Wednesday as the overly dreaded, constantly overused term of Mary Sue at this rate with how much the story and characters are made subservient to her without any other major flaw beyond how much of a catch she isn't. Anyhow, the sheriff we saw earlier storms in and happens to be Tyler's dad who is shocked at what he was seeing assuming Tyler got involved. Weems also discovers Wednesday through this which gets the sheriff on his bad side towards Wednesday as he exposits that her father was a murderer coming as a surprise to Wednesday. After that whole ordeal, we pan to nighttime as Wednesday plays a cello while we get corresponding shots of Rowan going down somewhere and grabbing a book telepathically as to establish he has those powers. He proceeds to rip a page off a book regarding some crude drawing. This will be extremely important for how Wednesday even gets involved in the central plot, but anyhow, we also see Tyler is poking around the crim criminal records, presumably to find the one regarding Gomez that his father mentioned which will also be extremely important for a plot elements regarding episode 6. After the musical flurry, we get more dialogue between Anid and Wednesday, whom I haven't even brought up that Anid is a werewolf up to this point, as it's not really fundamental until the final episode if you can believe that. Anyhow, Anid is upset that she can't wolf out as is customary for her kind, and feels that if she can't she will be doomed to loneliness. Of course, Wednesday, being as she is, can't really reciprocate that feeling other than regarding a flashback where some bullies killed her pet Scorpion when she was six, as that's a weird thing for someone to have as one. This could have been an opportunity upon on why Wednesday is more get even when it comes to circumstances like this, or even why she seems to revolve around other social outcasts, as that is the only consistent through line with the characters who bother to involve themselves with her, but honestly, this flashback almost comes off as cheeky, and I know that wasn't supposed to be. Anyhow, this back and forth allows Wednesday to have a need helper get in contact with Tyler using the dreaded computer. Thing appears at Tyler's house to lay down her plan to him. How Thing, Wednesday, or Anid even know where Tyler lives is beyond me, on top of the fact that it was previously established that Nevermore to Jericho is a 25 minute drive, meaning that it would have been hours for Thing to walk his way over. Wednesday's plan involves having Tyler attend the Harvest Festival this weekend as a cover for him to drive Wednesday to the station out of here. Through this, we thusly establish a love triangle as Xavier and Tyler get acquainted with each other, adding on to the tropes regarding high school dramas. More on them as we press on through the episodes, but Wednesday gets Weems distracted to have her go meet Tyler at the parking lot. It's not really one from what we're seeing and Tyler gives her the police report of her dad he was filing through earlier. Everything seems to be in order, but oh no, hijinks ensue. The bullies from the Weather Vane Cafe return with weapons that chase them off into the opposite direction. She bumps into Rowan, who's also here to have Wednesday get a whole splurge of future visions, including of Rowan getting killed, which for some reason gets Wednesday the moxie to chase after Rowan to save him? Earlier, the old croon that Wednesday ran into in Jericho gave her a vision of him dying in a car crash and she didn't have any reason to tell him, so why would she care about Rowan? She hasn't established at all caring about the safety of anyone else, even if it's supposed to be in her character to watch out for the little guy. But ultimately, this is all to establish that Rowan wants to kill Wednesday because of some prophecy his mother wrote in an inscription that she would destroy the school and everyone in it. Of course, why Rowan would even give a fuck about the school or anyone in it when he's been nothing but a shut-in in a school full of shut-ins is beyond me, but he's essentially the exposition Sunday to get Wednesday involved in both the conspiracy involving her and the string of murders as some plants vs. zombie looking motherfucker saves Wednesday and rips Rowan into shreds before quickly darting off. Of course, Rowan brought the torn picture of her her with him so that he can establish his reasons when in any other circumstances where someone has good reason to kill someone else wouldn't even bother extrapolating why more so than do the deed. Now you also have to understand that Rowan attempted to kill Wednesday completely out of pocket as the only reason he had an opportunity to was because of her chasing him, her running into him, and her having to run away from the pilgrim bullies. 
So why Rowan would have brought the page with him if A, he already knows the prophecy and doesn't need to have that picture to remind him, and B, didn't premeditate this act to show her why he has to, is another major contrivance the story allots that gets to square the circle of Wednesday into the picture. After all the shenanigans, Wednesday gets FaceTimed by her parents via Crystal Ball to ask her how her first week has been. From what she's experienced, considering her morbid attitude, has changed Wednesday to actually like Nevermore, if for nothing else but to figure out the prophecy, the monster who saved her, and of her father's presumed act of murder. And that, ladies and gentlemen, closes out episode 1, and boy is it not a good impression for the rest of the episodes going in. I know this was a lot to take in for just one episode, but believe me when I say, the rest of the episodes should go by much faster as we've laid the groundwork for the setting, characters, and central plot going in. Wednesday has so far been nothing but insufferable throughout this entire episode, and we've still seven more of her awfulness not being accounted for by the other characters because of desperation from the writers to make her seem cool, smart, and above it all. We start episode 2 with a police manhunt for the one who killed Rowan, or at least that's what I thought when the following day it actually turns out that they were merely looking for Rowan's body, which has gone mysteriously absent with literally no trace of him in sight, which I find especially hard to believe given that Wednesday would have likely had a trace of blood on her, as well as a note that conveniently lapsed on Rowan's dead body, but we'll get to why there's no trace of him soon. The Sheriff and Weems have a back and forth where the Sheriff is quick to pin this on Nevermore in some way while Weems dismisses a crime having even been committed on top of vouching for the Mayor's claim of a bear attack that the Sheriff forwarded in spite of his reluctance to believe it. Now again there is some important subtext to glean from why Weems is quick to denounce such a claim or even of an incident happening as this trickles back into Wednesday's account to which she partially stretches the truth to her reasons for being out in the woods. Wednesday wants a private moment between Sheriff Galpin, which gets Weems to be a bit pensive on that offer, but she soon relents and gives them their private chat. I'm assuming Weems is trying to defend Wednesday and in turn the integrity of the Nevermore students from Galpin, who has been on the offensive, but I think there is a more ulterior motive behind her reluctance to the private chat we can discuss later. Wednesday tells the Sheriff that she suspects a cover-up of Rowan's murder, but from who or why she does not know. The sheriff is doubtful, but only because Wednesday is the daughter of someone who he believes is a murderer, which she also puts doubt on that claim. Now again, I know this is making an adaptation arguments, but considering how Gomez Adams was depicted in the first Adams Family movie to casually have a duel with his realtor, to the death no less, kind of undermines that sentiment Wednesday shares. Regardless, Sheriff's partner barges in to reveal that Rowan is suddenly alive and well to the utter shock of Wednesday. Suspiciously, Weems is not present to witness the sudden revelation, nor seem to happenstance bump into the sheriff's partner to take notice of this, but again, there's a very important and simultaneously stupid reason for that. We cue to Wednesday's next therapy session where she is basically interrogated by her therapist as to why she would make such an outlandish claim, which derails into her adjusting to Nevermore. Once again, the therapist apes the sentiments I share that in no way Wednesday is justified to be so distrusting of her parents' reasons for sending her to Nevermore, but regardless, Wednesday wants to be an island, so to say. More like an archipelago of all the other armpit sniffers that gravitate towards her, like Tyler, who's somewhat surprised to see Wednesday sticking around in her therapy sessions with Kimbot. Their back and forth isn't substantial other than that Tyler out of all does believe what Wednesday witnessed with her own eyes, but again, why he believes that will be all laid in plain for the foreseeable future. Through this, we do get a look of endearment by Wednesday, at least as well as endearment goes for her before we shuffle back to the school functions. Anid and some of her cohorts are at work painting a canoe for the annual Poe Cup that will be the school's centerpiece throughout this episode. If it hasn't been apparent to the rest of you, each of these episodes picks apart a section of the prophecy regarding Adams and the murder mystery while having a school flavor of the week episode, as episode 3 will be carried towards romantic melodrama and episode 4 is the fucking school dance. So yeah, the tropes are not amiss in this show either. Anyhow, Anita is curious as to why Wednesday stuck around, and Wednesday gives about as brief and 
intellectually compensating for something of a response regarding it. From this, Wednesday prods some information from a need regarding Rowan as a person, and the best she can muster is that he's Xavier's roommate and that he's a loner. Wednesday will embark on that lead soon, but for now we get Wednesday reminiscing on the picture Rowan left behind and notices a faint watermark on the corner as a sort of clue as to its source. The following day, she goes to Weems demanding to speak to Rowan regarding the picture, to which Weems says he's been expelled while not explaining why. Weems also asks Wednesday again why she was out skulking for Rowan, believing that Wednesday had a psychic vision, vindicated by what Wednesday said earlier about the accident involving the farmer, as well as being around her mother around the same age as Wednesday when she had those similar visions. Of course, Wednesday hadn't really conversed with her mother, much less anybody about these visions she has been having. But we don't really get to explore that as Wednesday needs to go seek out an extracurricular activity by the end of this day, which will no doubt contrive her to join a need on the Poe Cup. Now, I've had heard that the defense for Wednesday taking part in the Fitzy match was that she had no choice, but this line basically sells it for me that she did have a choice and chose to do something she would normally abhor just to flex on everyone else. From her exchange with Weems, Wednesday suspects that she has a watchful eye on her, which gives her the idea to have Thing go keep tabs on Rowan. Afterwards, Wednesday goes to Bianca to try to vindicate her account of the situation to which Bianca tells her that she went to Weems instead of the cops after Wednesday passed out. Now, in episode 1, we don't see Wednesday black out or pass out, so unless this is a result of shitty editing or that Wednesday is lying to cover her real reasons for seeking out Rowan, feels as though retconned in. Then we get this awkward section where Bianca makes a jab at Wednesday and she does this extremely low pitch whine that breaks one of the student's glasses and a jar in Weems' office. I guess just to be a prick to someone who didn't do anything wrong to her? Good going there, Wednesday. I like you even less now? Wednesday then goes to meet Xavier at Arrow Practice to ask him the last time he saw Rowan, and Xavier gives Wednesday a straightforward answer while giving her the cold shoulder, presumably out of jealousy for her thing with Tyler. Wednesday explains to Xavier that he was only a means to get her out of the town prior to what she witnessed, only for Xavier to fight back that Tyler is a bully himself who can't stand that Nevermore is the only thing keeping Jericho relevant. And through this, Wednesday makes herself even more of a unlikable cunt by saying that Xavier was born with a silver spoon and that he's a elitist snob with 100% zero self-awareness of her being an elitist snob throughout and being granted entry into Nevermore by sheer nepotism. On top of, once again, flexing on Xavier's archery skills by shooting an apple mid-air into a bullseye because boy those writers really need to remind us how cool and awesome she is. Now, do remind me, wasn't Wednesday trying to get information about Rowan through Xavier? I get that Xavier derailed this talk a bit regarding Tyler, but how does this benefit Wednesday to be a holier than thou bitch towards him to relay any info he might be safekeeping for his own sake? Because I can tell you right now, he is. Anyhow, we pan to a beekeeper hive and the last new character, Eugene, introduces himself to Wednesday and his beekeeping plans. There's literally no reason why Wednesday is here dialogue-wise other than meta-contextual for us to be introduced to Eugene as he will become suddenly and incredibly important for something later as Thing is also here pointing to Wednesday regarding something urgent. So, not sure why they needed to have this scene in the first place. The only thing I can fathom a reason is of what Weem said earlier about Wednesday needing to find an extracurricular activity, and we do see briefly her holding the pamphlet Weems gave her, so maybe that's why she's been going from activity to activity throughout? Wednesday goes to confront Rowan before he leaves for his train, as she tries to jog his memory of the things he told her before he was killed. Rowan only accounts trying to clear his head before getting chased by her, before shuffling to his car with Thornhill to assist. Fortunately for Wednesday, Thing latches onto the car to investigate further, which involves a sequence of Thing chasing after Rowan while trying not to get caught himself. We then get the reveal that the Rowan that we thought was alive was none other than Weems herself, as she can shapeshift into other people, which is also why Thing loses track of his lead on Rowan. Now, several glaring problems are made with this. Now, 
Do you remember how Weems was keeping watch of Wednesday at the Harvest Festival? If Weems supposedly had the ability to shapeshift, couldn't she, I don't know, morph into some unassuming festival goer or even one of the festival employees to give Wednesday a false sense of security? Meaning that Weems chose to be front and center to allow Wednesday a distraction to facilitate what happens afterwards? Secondly, if what Weems was saying is true about how Rowan's extended family haven't made calls, presumably because they believe Rowan is still alive, wouldn't this shapeshift plan only work temporarily? Wouldn't they start blowing up Nevermore Academy with calls about his whereabouts, which in turn would cast suspicion on Weems covering up Rowan's murder? Furthermore, I highly fucking doubt that Weems had the time nor the means to cover up Rowan's murder if Bianca went to her about the incident and without Wednesday getting wise to it. Although I suppose that's why they retconned Wednesday getting knocked out afterwards despite never seeing it happen at all to allot Weems to cover it up. But even with that retcon, that only accounts Wednesday's absence. You mean to tell me no one else saw an inconspicuous Weems dragging a dead Rowan somewhere she knew the cops wouldn't look and that Weems somehow knew of a location the cops wouldn't be able to discover his dead body on top of doing so in a swift and clean manner that not even a trace of the body could be found anywhere? And this is all only to account for the how of Weems' decision to do this. The why will only get brought up once Wednesday does discover that Weems is a shapeshifter later on and subtextual through her conversations with the mayor. Hell, for all I know, Weems has co-conspirators in the academy that assisted, but that's assuming we ever see any of the faculty at Nevermore apart from Thornhill and the coach at the fencing match. And clearly, Thornhill couldn't have been a part of the cover-up for two extremely important reasons that will be explained later. So we have to take for granted that Weems single-handedly was able to micromanage a murder from just hearsay by a student cover it up by pretending to be Rowan and herself at the same time without raising any suspicions from the lack of presence of either and all in the interest of safekeeping Nevermore's likely culpability in the string of attacks? It's kind of odd too that with what Wednesday said to Weems believing her to be Rowan that that didn't spark any curiosity from Weems as to what Rowan said specifically, especially considering Weems was already doubtful of Wednesday's account of the events. Even some acknowledgement or smirk of, I knew you were lying, would suffice, but it's like Rowan is acting perfectly in character up until he transforms into Weems, when shapeshifters can't perfectly morph the mannerisms or dialect of any given person. More on that later when her abilities get used again. After that rant, we can get back to the show proper. We segue to a greenhouse where Thornhill is teaching about her field of expertise largely plants and plant life while Wednesday rails thing about how he lost sight of Rowan. At least I assume that this is a class section and not another one of the uh, extracurricular activities that Wednesday was adequate for anyhow because again, the classroom functions of Nevermore are really in disarray the farther we dig into it. All the major characters are here, including Xavier, whose drawing of a spider is so elaborate that it literally comes to life in some strange way to impress Wednesday. The significance of Xavier's drawings will be important for the plot and the absolute red herring of a suspect Xavier will become throughout that I almost feel sorry that he gets gaslit constantly as a result of the plot, but that's an aside for now. Anyhow, Thornhill starts her class regarding the world of plants trying to quiz the students about the veracity of one presented. Again, Wednesday tries too hard to be smart while also sounding uninterested as she blurts out the answer without being called on while sounding like the most boring Wikipedia article describing it. Now, clunkily, this is all to establish the rivalry Bianca and her are having as Wednesday serves as a threat to what you need, said earlier about Bianca's kingsmanship and never more slipping, but delivered this way almost makes me hope that Bianca will up end her rather than root for her since I've no reason to hate Bianca other than her quips at Wednesday, which honestly are well deserved given her attitude towards her currently. After that, we get an exchange between Sheriff Galpin and Tyler, where Tyler is curious where his father is going and Galpin tells him that he's still chasing ghosts regarding the string of murders while dead set on pinning it on Nevermore. 
Galpin is also a bit suspicious about Tyler's reluctance to let him in on his therapy sessions with Kimbot before Tyler brings a sore topic to Galpin about his mom, which gets Galpin to drop the subject altogether and pursue the lead. The importance of their relationship again will be made more apparent when we understand what happened to Galpin's wife slash Tyler's mom, but it cannot be understated just how deep the subtext goes between Tyler's estrangement with his dad and how little it is utilized throughout. Wednesday asks Sunid to help cover for her while she looks out in the woods for any trace of Rowan's murder again. Anita refuses on part of being preoccupied with the Poe Cup and that bees creep her out which also awkwardly segues into her mentioning that Thing is upset with Wednesday about something. Anid says she'll consider helping Wednesday if she reconciles with Thing, aping a sentiment that I'm sure the audience is screaming at Wednesday for, not even giving an ounce of shit about what should be her extended family up to this point. We get the exchange between Wednesday and Thing, which goes about as well as an exchange between an utter tool of a human being and a literal hand would go. Although I do like how expressive Thing needs to be to emulate his thoughts on the matter. Surprisingly, Wednesday is a bit troubled with the possibility of causing great harm to Nevermore and wants clarification or the truth of the matter which gets Thing on his good graces. Back at beekeeping, Anid holds her end of the deal while Eugene gets giddy about girls being in his shed because the nerdy loner getting a boner from seeing girls for the first time hasn't already aged like feta cheese. Wednesday goes skulking about in the woods before nearly getting intercepted by Sheriff Galpin before Tyler grabs her outside of his view. Now, remember what I said about the spatial presence of things not really taken into account? How the hell did Tyler get to the woods around the same time as Sheriff Galpin, and precisely when Wednesday was out looking for clues? Remember, Galpin rode by truck to this precise spot, whereas Wednesday likely only had to walk a few blocks to get to the woods, which also means Galpin would have been hella lucky to come across Wednesday at this exact moment too? Tyler exclaims to Wednesday that he's been throwing off his father's lookout with coffee grounds, which might explain why Galpin couldn't find Rowan's body earlier, but considering he had an entire manhunt out there, wouldn't. Also, that Tyler somehow had time to do this while Weems also was covering it without either of them bumping into each other is curious, especially when Tyler asks Wednesday what really happened at the Harvest Festival which sort of puts a damper on him previously believing Wednesday earlier unless he just believed that Wednesday saw Rowan get murdered and not how or why Wednesday was put in that predicament to begin with. But why Tyler is even asking any of this when he, whoops, almost spoiled something there, will have to be saved for later. Anyhow, Wednesday explains the details to Tyler before they stumble across Rowan's broken glasses. As Wednesday grabs it, she gets another flashback where she sees Rowan use his telekinesis to move the gargoyle statue that nearly killed her earlier on top of an argument Rowan and Xavier having about something mostly unintelligible. Now, I haven't mentioned up to this point that Rowan was also responsible for the gargoyle that had nearly fallen onto Wednesday, as I felt it pertinent to bring it up here regarding the flashback, which also puts problems into his second attempt at killing her. Considering that Rowan didn't feel inclined to explain to Wednesday why he needed to kill her or bring a vague clue with him upon his first attempt, why the fuck would he on his second? Which means his reasons for doing so were utterly to facilitate what happens in the rest of the season as his means to kill her the first time were not only much smarter, but also didn't require him expositing why. From the visions, Wednesday keeps seeing a purple book that would be a lead into the page Rowan ripped out so she goes into the library to search for it. As she is, Thornhill stumbles in to ask Wednesday what she's looking for, to which Wednesday only gives her details about the watermark she saw on the ripped page. Thornhill says it looks like a symbol for an old society called the Nightshades that had disbanded some time ago. Through this, we get a heart-to-heart -heart moment between Thornhill and Wednesday, as they sort of share the outsider's dilemma given that Thornhill is the only normie staff on board and Wednesday's callousness towards anything living. There might be more significance to this scene later on than I'm giving, but it is nice to see Wednesday sort of confide in someone, even if coldly. Next scene, we capture Xavier on his late night jog before heading towards his dorm. Wednesday was waiting for him, of course, to scoop in on whether he has the purple book she's looking for. 
She uses a miniature blacklight to find some handprints on the floorboards revealing a curious mask before needing to hide under Xavier's bed as he gets a surprise visit from Bianca. Supposedly, Bianca isn't supposed to be here, which I'm not sure if that has to do with the dorms being gender segregated or of her being a siren and him not, as he brings up that fact only for her to counter with her necklace being a damper to those powers. Ultimately, Bianca is concerned about Rowan only because of Xavier's fascination with Wednesday brought about from Rowan's veiled threats to harm her. So, jealousy is on the menu for this dialogue exchange, as Xavier feels manipulated by Bianca's power and that Wednesday hasn't tried to manipulate him once. That line will age incredibly poorly as the episodes linger, but it is quite humorous that he's saying this now without knowing the facts. Bianca brings some pointed arguments to why Xavier being so infatuated with Wednesday is stupid, but unfortunately Bianca is the antagonist of this episode, so obviously we aren't supposed to believe her despite being on the fucking money for it. She also brings up that she plans on rigging the Poe cup as she does to shove it in a needs, and by extension, Wednesday's face, which obviously gets us on her bad side again for the plot. After returning to Ophelia Hall, we see Anid losing her shit because she lost someone who would have participated at the Poke Cup for arbitrary reasons. Oh no! Who could possibly fill in that slot at this time, at this hour, and would have a motivation to do so to stick it in Bianca's face? Eugene, obviously! But yes, Wednesday joins Anid to compete in the Poke Cup, which wants me to get back to that line Anid said earlier about the nature of said cup. Part canoe race, part foot chase? No rules. Now, if you thought the no tips clause at the fencing match was a blatant disregard for student safety, boy, you haven't seen nothing yet. The teams are all set at the docks while Anid passes a flirty hand to Ajax, who is competing for the Gorgons, presumably. Bianca makes another jab at Wednesday, surprised to see her competing, only for Wednesday to say the same thing Bianca said to Xavier last night, which should really put her alarm bells ringing that Wednesday was spying on Xavier, but no, Bianca just scrunches her face while Wednesday again shows that in trying to one-up Bianca, she ultimately proves her right by saying that she is better than Bianca, who at this moment thinks is better than anyone else, meaning that Wednesday, if you put two and two together, you do believe you are better than everyone else if you think you are better than the person who believes they are better than everyone else, you stupid tryharding cunt. <sighs> Weems announces the start of the Poe Cup while expositing to the audience the nature of this race, per se. She shoots the breeze and the races are off. The no rules clause goes into full effect as Bianca nods to another siren who takes a deep dive towards one of the leading ships. As the black cat ship gets caught up by some berserker looking ship, this lovely scene plays where the entire crew narrowly dodge getting fucking decapitated by a hydraulic axe mounted onto the opposing team's canoe. Now, as action packed as this scene would be, this causes severe implications for the nature of the Poe Cup, that not only is lethal violence allowed on said race, but that people have died to a contraption like this for people like Anid and crew to instinctively know to duck under it. But that's not even going into the fact that for all we know, none of the people on this Poe Cup can even swim if the canoe happens to sink, and none of the competitors have life vests present to account for such a thing either, as it will become apparent once the rogue siren sabotages the Berserker ship into an uncommon buoy. Like, I understand that Nevermore Academy is supposed to be sort of uncouth for traditional academies, but I can't imagine that trying to kill competitors in an annual race is conducive in any way to the longevity of the academy. Shit, it almost makes me think Sheriff Galpin has a point that Nevermore would be responsible for the string of murders if they regard their students this way, which makes it more weird how skeptical any of the academy students are to Wednesday witnessing a murder of a fellow student if shit like this can just happen and it's just treated as the no rule policy of this rule. I mean, why even structure a race to have no rules like this if it only will cause teams to do the dirtiest of tactics? And what meaning does winning this race entail if you can just as easily kill the competition rather than outcompete it? Like, 
I expect shit like this for the Adams family to do as a family thing, but not for a public boarding school, even if Nevermore is supposed to be as morbid as the Adams family itself. All my complaining about this race is ultimately meaningless as Wednesday spots the rogue siren in the distance. Curious how no one else spotted this prior considering what Anid said about there likely being a sabotage on the siren's part. Anyhow, Thing presses a lever that shoots out a net that entraps the siren who was about to sabotage their canoe, putting him out of commission temporarily. The Gorgon team make it to the shore first and leave a few of their men behind to watch after their boat. Good move, honestly, considering just how violent the other competitors are willing to be towards one another just to win. Anid gets Thing to distract the Gorgons guarding their boat, while Wednesday catches up to the Gorgons chasing after the flag on Crackstone Crypt. Anid sabotages the boat in the most humane way by punching holes into it, so at least when the Gorgon team's boat sinks, they'll be near the shore not to fucking drown by god. Considering the allowance of violence towards one another, I'm surprised the Gorgon team didn't just try to impale Wednesday with the fucking flag as they were passing through, but regardless, they pass, and as Wednesday grabs the flag and the edge of the crypt, she once again gets a bevy of vision. So intense, she literally gets knocked out and transposed to a different time. An uncommon reskin of Wednesday stands across from her, only relaying a vague message before Wednesday comes to from her nap. Bianca standing above, waiting to mock her before running off with their flag. Again, I'm surprised with as die-hard as the competitors are that Bianca didn't just try to knock her ass unconscious with the flag, but again, so didn't Wednesday, so all's fair in love and war. Wednesday looks back at the crypt as another clue to her significance to this prophecy before getting back to brass tacks with the race. The Gorgon team are currently in the lead until Ajax notices that the canoe is taking in water and slows their descent for the Black Cats to dart on ahead. The Black Cats start to catch up to the Sirens before the Rogue Siren returns and pushes their boat off course just as Wednesday had put up another contraption that would have gutted the Sirens boat. Again, gotta love the casual disregard for anyone who likely can't swim for this to happen. Makes me think the mortality rate in Jericho is 200 per 1,000 people or some shit. Before the Black Cats suffer the same fate that the Berserker ship did, Thing swims underwater and knocks out the Siren in one fell blow, which gets the Black Cats back on course and able to use the contraption to gut the canoe. Fortunately, without gutting the respective thighs of the competitors either. Wednesday and Anid celebrate their victory by running the flag to the finish, which feels like a meaningless gesture considering the only team that didn't cheat was the fucking Gorgon team of all, but I guess good sportsmanship is a dying fad in Nevermore Academy, as well as living for that matter. Wednesday and crew are all in attendance of the award ceremony regarding the Poke Cup, while Weems gives this sophistry about what it means, clearly disregarding how having no rules defeats the whole meaning behind teamwork or determination. Wednesday doesn't want anything to do with this and quickly walks off, sitting by a statue of Edgar Allan Poe to recoup. She spots the inscription via the book on the statue she sat under before Anid finds her alone and wonders if she'll hang out. Weirdly, Wednesday considers it, which I suppose is supposed to reflect her warming up to Anid and the school as a whole. Weems comes to congratulate Wednesday personally while also stating that her mother captained the Poke Cup the last time the Ophelia Hall team won it, trying to breach a parallel towards Wednesday and her mother, which, hey, should have recognized that given her flagrant try-hardiness at the fencing match, you dumb bitch, but any whoms. Late at night, Wednesday is monologuing to herself again while typing up her novel. She looks at the watermark on the red page again, which gets her to skulk in the dark to the Poe statue she sat at earlier. She looks at the riddles laid out in the statue's book, surprisingly intact and legible too after 125 years, encoding it to be the most on-the-nose reference to the Adams family we get in this show as the answer involves Wednesday snapping twice like in the theme song in front of the statue. Through this, the statue opens to the secret passageway with a centerpiece podium reminiscent of the one Rowan was in when he poured through the pages. She finds the book through looking at the dust markings on the bookshelf and finds the missing half to the page Rowan ripped out. Wednesday stows the book and is ready to leave before she gets inexplicably kidnapped by unknown forces, which we'll be able to get into as this is a cliffhanger for episode 3 and a cliffhanger for part 2 of this series as I plan on releasing this in separate parts as opposed to a single video regarding the copyright nature of this show as a whole. 
And that was episode two, not much better than what we've established from episode one, and the string of murders will get even more convoluted as we march onwards, especially prudent given the nature of Weems being able to cover it or of Nevermore's function as a whole. And while Wednesday has been slowly getting humbled throughout, a lot of characters who do happen to call her out on her shit are the ones we aren't supposed to be rooting for, which causes a dichotomy with the audience that wasn't intended by the writers. But we can get into that and more with part two and subsequently episode three. Until then, allons-y!